Hello, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I am your host, Kelly Cawthorn, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Happy April. Spring has finally made its way here. Flowers are blooming, the birds are chirping, and there is pollen everywhere. Today, we're discussing how you can outsmart your allergies this allergy season. I have with me allergist Dr. Eric Sandberg from Kelsey Siebold's main campus. He is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. His clinical interests include children and adult allergies and a wide range of allergy conditions. He joined Kelsey Siebold in May of 1995. And an interesting fact about him, he was actually a mathematics major in college and spent three years teaching high school math in West Africa. Now it's about that time to hear from you. In your webinar window, you should see today's poll question. What are you currently doing to relieve your allergy symptoms? Take a few seconds to go ahead and vote, and I'll be sure to announce the results at the end. We have over-the-counter remedies, allergy shots, prescription medication, or maybe you're not doing anything for your allergies. Also, at the end of the webinar, we will be taking any questions that you may have, and Dr. Sandberg will take a few minutes to answer them. Okay, thank you for voting. I'm going to get ready to close the polls. And I will hand it over to Dr. Sandberg. Thank you, Kelly. Glad to be here today and have a chance to talk about allergies. Welcome from the um, main campus. There's some construction going on here, so if you hear vibrations or pounding in the background, I think I'll still be safe. We're going to start out today with what is an allergy, and an allergy is an abnormal immune response to foreign proteins. Of course, this time of year, that's mainly pollen that we're concerned about but we also see plenty of patients that have dust, food, venom, or even medication allergies. And these allergies often target the nose, the eyes, the lungs, the skin, or the intestines. Of course, at this time of year with the pollen, we're concerned about that targeting of the nose, the eyes, and the lungs. These allergies are a very common problem, so when you have allergies, you don't have to worry about being in the minority because more than half of all Americans have allergies. And what we see mostly in our clinic is nasal allergy, or what's termed allergic rhinitis. Allergic rhinitis is also called hay fever. It causes cold-like symptoms um, and, and signs. It's different from the common cold because it isn't caused by a virus. Now, it's hard to distinguish sometime between the common cold and hay fever, but certainly the absence of fever, the clear discharge, often suggest allergic rhinitis. And these allergic rhinitis can occur in two forms, both seasonal and perennial. The seasonal, of course, is most common here in the spring and the fall. And as you can imagine, March and October are the two busiest months in our clinic. But remember, many people with year-round allergies often have seasonal flair, so these ideas can overlap. Now, for allergic rhinitis, the most common allergens are pollens. Now, at this time of year, we're worried about tree pollens especially, and we know that with oak pollen here in Houston, that's the major offender. Also, grass pollens can be playing a role at this time of year. In September and October, we see more of the ragweed pollen. Many of our patients, especially the children, are allergic to dust mites, and that can increase our sensitivity to other things. Animal danders are frequent allergens, especially cats, probably cats more than dogs, um, but many animals, even in laboratory workers, can cause nasal allergies. Here in Houston with our weather, molds are often an important cause as well. Allergic rhinitis can affect 
40 million different Americans. Mostly this develops in childhood or young adulthood, but we do see some patients that get their start of allergic rhinitis in their 30s, 40s, and even older. There is a genetic predisposition, and we're going to discuss that a little bit later. And in adults, it's one of the most common chronic illnesses. And certainly for office visits, it's a very common problem for doctors to evaluate. We know that millions and millions of days are lost from school and work, but probably even worse are days where we go to work, but we're affected by those allergies and we're not functioning at full speed. And people have estimated the direct cost may exceed over $4 billion a year. Now the symptoms of allergic rhinitis you're probably familiar with. Runny nose, watery itchy eyes, sneezing, and cough. But the problem that bothers the most people with the greatest severity really is that congestion, that nasal congestion. And when we can't sleep at night or we're so stuffy we can't breathe, it becomes a great discomfort. Additionally, we can have sinus pressure or facial pain. And some patients start to lose their sense of smell or taste. And when that happens, we know that more aggressive therapy is really needed. What time of year are allergies the worst? Well, that depends on the patient. Certainly for big groups of people, it's this time, like I mentioned, in the spring and the fall. But some people have other seasonal times. There are people with cedar allergy that have trouble in the winter time. And of course, many people just have year-round allergies, especially if there's dust mites or cat dander involved. One of the things to remember about nasal allergies is it doesn't always go by itself. These patients have increased problems with ear infections, sinus infections. We see patients with nasal polyps. Of course, those itchy eyes can be very aggravating, and fortunately, there's good treatment for that. Patients with allergic rhinitis also, also have more eczema, and asthma is much more likely in these patients. And so it's not uncommon to have to treat both the upper respiratory and the lower re respiratory tract. Who gets allergies? Well, these allergies can occur at any age, as I mentioned, but we said in childhood and early adulthood, certainly in the early 20s, is a very common time. The factor of genetics is very interesting. If neither parent is allergic, the chances of someone developing allergies is fairly low, about 1 in 7 or 15 percent. If one parent is allergic, the risk of an offspring increases to about 30 percent. And if both parents are allergic, a child's risk of developing allergies is over 50 percent. Although someone may inherit that tendency towards allergies, they may not never actually develop the allergies, and we're not sure what the real trigger or switch is that goes from predisposition to actual symptoms. It's clear, though, that the more intense and repetitive the exposure to an allergen is, and it's more likely that that allergy can develop. So for someone that grows up in Denver where there's no dust mites, the chances of dust mite allergy is very, very low. That's quite a bit different than here in Houston. Now, let's think of some ways that we can outsmart your allergies. And we want to run through some of those here this afternoon. We want to rethink your exercise plan. We want to consider working out indoors when allergies are acting up. And for some people, that will allow them to maintain the active lifestyle. The more air we breathe in, the more airborne pollen and mold spores you inhale. We try to minimize the exposure to allergens and consider extra medications before working out. And certainly we increase our medicines during the seasonal flares as well. But one reminder, let's not let our allergy symptoms stop our exercise because that's critical to remaining good health in so many ways. We also want to watch out for non-seasonal allergies. We know that this is a bad time of year but if we increase our exposures to cats during this time, for example, that may increase our seasonal allergies.
We also want to be smart about our outdoor exposure and our gardening. Some people choose to avoid gardening altogether and have someone else do it. And for patients that have strong grass allergens, grass pollen allergens, that can be a good strategy to have someone else mow the yard. But in the end, we don't want people to limit their activities because of their allergies. And if being out in the garden is something that you really enjoy, we want to find ways to control those symptoms so that you can participate. Sometimes we use an antihistamine, an oral antihistamine, or a nasal antihistamine before going outside. Some people try to use a mask. It's not always successful because some of these pollens are really smaller than the pores in the mask, but some people do get some benefit from using that. The other thing to remember is that if we're going to be gardening on the weekend, we may benefit by using our medicines all week long and not just when we think we might need them. Another option that we can consider is give yourself a good scrubbing. Certainly showering more often may keep those allergy symptoms at bay. And certainly during the shower time, if we can remember to use some nasal saline, that will help wash out our nose and keep things clean and clear. Certainly uh, pollen and mold can land on our, our hair, our clothes, our skin, and taking off clothes from outdoors, leaving them by the front door, um, washing our hands, rinsing, and a quick shower before bed sometimes helps patients. Even pets deserve consideration because they may be tracking some of those pollens indoors. Now, if these strategies aren't giving us um, good improvement, some things we can consider would be a stronger allergy treatment. Over-the-counter allergy pills like antihistamines and decongestants help a lot of patients, but if symptoms persist, we're looking for an upgrade. One of the things that your doctor can help you with would be nasal sprays. Oftentimes, they relieve these symptoms much better than pills do, and we know that these nasal sprays are topical treatments, and the side effects may be quite reduced compared to pills. For patients that fail General medications, allergy shots or allergy desensitization can be a big advantage for them. We can provide a safe amount of that allergens in a stepwise fashion and the immune system turns off its allergic tendencies and tolerance can develop. How about diet change? Will that help allergy? Well, a lot of people have suggested that sipping green tea and certainly that's a healthy approach. It's been shown to help some medical conditions. It's certainly part of a healthy lifestyle. Local honey is a frequent question that comes up in our clinic. And the local honey contains some of the local pollens, and so ingestion of those pollens could theoretically help. However, we caution against this because we believe that the dose of those pollens in the local honey will not be sufficient to really give us a therapeutic response. And so this may be more of a wives' tale than an actual therapy. Fruits and vegetables, that sounds good, a healthy lifestyle. But what's interesting is we see some patients with seasonal allergies that actually get worsening symptoms when they eat specific fruits and vegetables. For example, we have patients with strong tree pollen allergies, and when they eat avocados or bananas, they get itching in their mouth, and that may aggravate their overall allergy symptoms. So this could be a trick question for us. Some people find that spicy foods just open up the nasal passages and relieve some of the congestion. Um, that can work both ways. So I advise you, your mileage may vary on that. Exercise. We mentioned trying to keep up your exercise regimen, but consider yoga. We certainly know that stress promotes inflammation, which can heighten the body's allergic response. And if yoga can reduce that stress, that may help with our relief. I think it's also just a question of maintaining an active lifestyle. Using breathing techniques can open up the nasal passages, and certainly any activity that keeps our lungs working is going to help us out. Yoga classes are great, but a lot of people can even use the DVD in the privacy of your home. But trying to keep that activity three or four times a week during the allergy season and year-round is going to be a benefit. 
So when do we need to see the allergist? Certainly if your symptoms are out of control, if we're using medications and we're not functioning at full strength, then it's time to consider other possibilities. If patients are missing work or children are missing school, absolutely. We need to make sure these symptoms get under better control. Some patients just need medications during part of the year, but when medications are required year-round, allergy evaluation is often helpful to minimize those medications and maximize control. If patients are not tolerating their allergy medications, oftentimes an allergist can help suggest alternatives. And for some patients, for the right patients, allergy desensitization can be a good option. Well, let's sum things up here. Allergies are an abnormal response of the immune system to harmless substances, and right now we're thinking about pollens that are floating in the air. Anyone can have allergies, but critical factors include your genetics and your environment. There are ways to help treat allergies, and that includes over-the-counter medications, pills, eye drops, nasal sprays, and if we're not doing well with other treatments, we all will consider allergy shots. We want to avoid our allergy triggers when we can, but in the end, I think we can outsmart a lot of these allergies. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sandberg. We are now going to open the floor up to questions. So if you can take a few seconds to type in your questions so Dr. Sandberg can answer them. I was definitely paying attention myself. My mother and my brother suffer terribly from allergies, and I know it always gets worse during um, this time of year. So if you have your pen and paper ready, we're going to go ahead and jump to our question and answers. Okay, so our first question here, is it okay to take Claritin or Allegra for up to four months straight when treating allergies? Certainly there are a lot of people that use these oral antihistamines like Claritin and Allegra on a regular basis. And we know that that kind of routine treatment is safe and is often very effective. But the question as allergists that we'll try to ask is, if someone really requires these kind of pills on a daily basis, maybe there's a better alternative. Maybe a prescription nasal spray could make a big difference and provide better symptom relief. But from a safety standpoint, we're in good shape, but maybe it's time to consider some alternatives. Okay. Are there specific allergy remedies to prevent fluid that repeatedly builds and swells eyelid tissue while sleeping? Well, it often is going to depend on what causes that swelling around the eyes. Our patients with allergic conjunctivitis often do get that swelling. And what we need to do is treat the allergy side of things. Some of the over-the-counter allergy eye drops like Zatator or Ketotifen can be very, very useful, and that decreases the allergic response in the eye. We like to avoid eye drops like Visine because of, they contain the decongestants, and we try to avoid those activities. But swelling of the eyes can be caused by multiple different mechanisms, so if it's not an allergy, the treatment's going to depend on the underlying cause. All right. I saw a really good question up here that I wanted to get to. A lot of people get um, cold and allergy confused because a lot of the symptoms, some of the symptoms overlap. Um, does a dry hacking cough of, uh, is that considered a symptom of allergy without the nasal symptoms? We do see patients without nasal symptoms that are getting drainage in the back of their throat from their allergies, and that can cause that dry hacking cough. Another area of overlap is certainly sinus problems and allergy problems, and people say often they're not sure if it's sinuses or if it's allergies, but I would remind you that we can have allergy problems that cause sinus problems, and some of the sinus problems are caused by allergies, but there's not a perfect overlap between those two topics. The same would go with cough sometimes caused by allergies, sometimes not. Okay. Now, I've witnessed my own brother and my mother using the neti pot. Do you suggest a neti pot, and is there a recommended frequency for using that to get optimal results? 
Well, the neti pot is an excellent way to deliver some of the nasal saline or salt water sprayed through the nose and sinuses. Some people tolerate the use of that very well and get great benefit. For people who can't tolerate the neti pot, using a squeeze bottle or an aerosol bottle of the nasal saline can also give a good improvement. But nasal saline is so safe, it should be strongly considered by most of our patients. Right. So uh, sometimes people try to treat only a few of the symptoms that they get. Um, we have a question here that asks, to manage headaches and congestion, is it okay to occasionally add Sudafed and Excedrin migraine to a daily Claritin or Allegra? Well, certainly if um, Claritin or Allegra, those oral antihistamines aren't providing relief, we do need to add additional medicines. Some people add in the decongestants. But remember, when we add that decongestant, we increase the risk of high blood pressure, we increase the risk of insomnia, and sometimes there are better alternatives. Some of the nasal sprays, nasal steroids, or nasal antihistamines can be good alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a simple question. Well, maybe for you it is, not for me. <laughs> How would you know if, a food, if food was the causing your allergies versus, I guess, the environment? Well, for most of the symptoms we've talked about today, the nasal um, symptoms, food allergies are not a common cause. We do have situations where food allergies do cause problems. One that I mentioned earlier, the itchy mouth and scratchy throat that occurs after some of the fresh fruits and vegetables during the tree pollen season. But for other foods like peanut allergy and shrimp allergy, those kind of reactions are immediate. They can include many different symptoms in the body, from gastrointestinal symptoms in the stomach um, to skin symptoms and also breathing problems. So it depends on the food, depends on the patient, and also the exposure. Okay. Let's see here. Can you naturally build a resistance against allergies? Besides treating it with uh, any type of allergy shot or medication, can you just kind of suffer through it and build a resistance against it? Well, that turns out to be a very interesting question to try to naturally build uh, tolerance. And I've always suspected that that happens um, in our patients. We see a lot of children with very, very strong dust mite allergies. And many times over the years, that sensitivity may be lost. We're not sure if the patient's building up tolerance or if the allergy burns itself out or exactly what the mechanism is, but there may be some things that work in that way. Of course, from our standpoint, we're interested in doing that in a more rapid fashion so people don't suffer for years and years, and good treatment or allergy shots can often accelerate that process. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. How often should you be tested for um, food allergies or, in that case, the allergies that are um, initiated by the environment? How often? Well, the frequency of testing depends strongly on the kind of symptoms that people um, are having. Oftentimes, when we see patients over the years for nasal allergies or for allergies causing asthma, we may test them just once because once we know those allergies, we have a good idea of the plan. And what's more important than the testing really is what is the treatment and what is the patient's response to that treatment. So for many people, we just test them one time. Sometimes in children who have egg or milk allergy, we'll retest them to help us understand whether or not we can try to reintroduce some of the foods that we've been avoiding for a long period of time. Yep. Dr. Sandberg, you might have a few um, over-the-counter medication that you suggest to your patients. Um, here uh, we have a viewer that asked if NyQuil was a good choice to help with congestion and nasal drainage. Would that be a product that you would recommend? Well, um, the NyQuil comes in so many different forms, it really depends on what it contains and what the patient's situation is. Certainly, again, some of the NyQuil products contain decongestants, and we try to avoid our exposure to those. When they include the um, oral antihistamines, we know that short-term use can be very helpful and it's a very reasonable choice. In extreme situations, some people have to go about getting surgery to clean out their nasal cavities. Um, are these surgeries considered like a quick fix 
or are they supposed to last long term? Well, hopefully the effect of a surgery is going to give someone long term improvement. But if the irritation that caused the initial problem is the allergies, we may need to keep ongoing treatment for the allergies even after sinus or nasal surgeries. So it's going to depend a lot on the situation. Here's another um, product question. Um, someone noticed that dr they happen to have drainage at night when they're sleeping, possibly due to their cat. So this person only takes Benadryl before they go to bed. Is it safe to take Benadryl every night after an extended period of time? We know that in general Benadryl is a safe um, medicine and there are people that use Benadryl uh, long term with uh, good effect. It probably does have some effect on our sleeping patterns and so if we can find alternatives to Benadryl for long-term issues, it's probably the best route to go. All righty. Well, that wraps up our question and answer section of our webinar. I wanted to share with you the results of our poll that we took today. The question was, what are you doing to relieve your allergy symptoms? And it looks like 63%, the majority, is used, are using um, over-the-counter remedies to uh, deal with their symptoms. I have 15% that, that are doing absolutely nothing, and poor things, I don't want you to suffer. So if your allergy symptoms continue, feel free to schedule an appointment with our allergists. I appreciate you joining us today. I know I certainly learned a lot from Dr. Sandberg and will definitely take this information to my brother and my mother. I mean, who knew that yoga could help with your um, allergy? That is something I completely learned today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you join us for next month. Dr. Uh, Kimberly, an audiologist, will be giving a presentation on how to turn down the danger of hearing loss. Also, don't forget, we are now giving away three $25 Target gift cards to listeners who stay the entire presentation. So keep registering, keep attending, and who knows, you might be our next winner. In the meantime, pull out your cell phones right now and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Oh, and don't forget Google+. Plus. I hope to see you. Well, I guess I can't see you, but I hope that you turn in tune in next month. And um, thank you so much for joining us.